All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and remember vapor liquid equilibrium. So, going back to my old ways, you open your exam, you see the word phase, you see the word equilibrium, what is your starting point? Partial fugacities being equal. So for vapor liquid equilibrium, we have Routes law as the starting point. How do we approximate the partial fugacity of a vapor for Routes law? All of you remember Routes law. It's just one half of it, but on the vapor side. Oh boy, it was a really long week. Why is the side? Yeah, no, almost, almost. <laughs> Why IP? Right. Pressure comes to the assumption that the pure ideal gas fugacity is just the system pressure. Weighting it by the mole fraction is what we call the Lewis Randall rule meaning that the volume when you mix two gases is roughly additive. That's an assumption of an ideal mixture. So P corresponds to ideal pure gas. The weighting by the mole fraction corresponds to ideal gas mixing. So there's two assumptions that go into that. Now for the liquid. The assumptions here are that if you have an ideal gas vapor phase, that the fugacity of the pure liquid is going to be equal to the saturation pressure. We're also assuming low pressure, meaning that we neglect the pointing correction. The ideal mixture component is the same as in the vapor phase, where you just do a weighted average of the mole fractions. So in this case, we're neglecting the activity coefficient. That's the common form. Now, oftentimes, and on Wednesday we'll talk about this, modified Routes Law is going to be your go-to starting point for even the most basic of vapor liquid equilibrium calculations. Because in general, even for simple systems, you're going to have deviations from ideality. So for the modified Routes Law, This is going to be our general starting point. Where the primary assumption here is that we have low pressure, meaning that the gas side is we can approximate as ideal. We can neglect the pointing correction, but we're having non-ideal mixing in the vapor phase, which means we include the activity coefficient. This is going to be the lion's share of even the introductory most accurate uh, vapor liquid equilibrium calculations. Now, the challenge here is that even the most basic and simple of activity coefficient models is going to be nonlinear, which means that we have to solve a complex system of equations to even get the most basic vapor liquid equilibrium accomplished. So what we're going to do instead is focus on ideal vapor liquid equilibrium to introduce the concepts, and then we're going to expand it to non-ideal vapor liquid equilibrium. <clears throat> so, in terms of a Flash calculation. Again, flash calculation is just a general thermodynamic term where we are using it to explain that we're going to calculate not only the concentration or sorry, composition of each phase, we're also going to be calculating the quantity of each phase. So, what we have here is in terms of equations, have a laundry list of equations. We have consistency relationships where we relate the mole fractions 
together, they all must add up to one. We have our equilibrium relationships. This is going to tell us through Routh's law potentially what we are going to have for our composition of vapor liquid equilibrium. And then we have material balances. You get to have one material balance per species. So we get one This is the total share of what we get to start off with for a phase equilibrium calculation. Now I've written this in the general form of vapor liquid equilibrium, but this is also appropriate for any phase equilibrium. The only difference is that in non-vapor liquid equilibrium, uh, we would generally write L as equal to the number of moles in phase I and V as equal to the number of moles in phase two. That's the only difference between making this general for liquid, liquid, solid, liquid, anything you'd like to do. The lion's share of what chemical engineers work with is going to be vapor liquid equilibrium, so that's the nomenclature that I'll be doing for most of the discussion. And it gets more complicated as soon as you get to you know, liquid, liquid, liquid. So, we need to know temperature, pressure, compositions, mole fractions, physical properties of the pure materials, because that's going to dictate what our saturation pressures are or what our pure fluid fugacities are. So we need a tremendous amount of information to solve these problems. All we need to do is we need to fix enough equations such that our degrees of freedom is equal to zero. Right? So degrees of freedom. See, do I have that backwards? That's the other one. Number of equations. So I've had more unknowns than equations as possible. I switched that around backwards. So depending on how complicated the system is, we can add all of this up give us a total number of equations, then we need to know that we need to specify enough variables so that the number of unknowns is equal to the number of unknowns in the equation. Give us zero degrees of freedom. Now if we can solve it, then it's just a big system of equations. Now for the most part, we're not going to want to solve a system just with a giant massive nonlinear solver. It's going to be a little bit more complicated than that. So for a two-component system, just as a reminder, This is going to be the simplest way that we're going to do it. Okay, this is the what I would consider the most straightforward flash calculation. Our feed is going to be fixed at one mole per second. We are going to have our two Routh's law relationships. Oftentimes I'll write just PA star just because I don't write saddle all the times. So I'll just write the star sometimes as opposed to sat or vapor pressure. So the P star in this case just to make things a little bit quicker and easier to write. So in general this is going to be our most straightforward type of flash calculation. Now once we solve the vapor liquid equilibrium, we need to include the F and the Z information to also get access to L and V. 
So if we count up our number of equations, basically we have one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of information, one, two, three, four, five, six things to solve for. That's going to be the general procedure. First, we will solve for Routes Law and understand the compositions. And then second, we will solve for the liquid and vapor total quantities using a material balance. That's going to be our, our most general starting point. Okay, so that's a recap of information. So what we'll do now is talk about distillation. So last week, or sorry, rather two weeks ago, we discussed a flash calculation. Let me just draw that out one more time just so we're all clear. We have some feed. Now, practically speaking, this is generally going to be a liquid. So one classic example of a pretty straightforward adiabatic flash is going to be a gas oil separator at a wellhead. So you have oil coming out of the ground, it's at high temperature and pressure, but it has a lot of dissolved gas into it. You don't want that gas to necessarily boil out of the system as the pressure drops and it goes through the pipeline because that changes what kind of pumps you want to use for the process. So instead, what you'll do is you'll flash by lowering the pressure, right? You don't want to put temperature into the system because you're putting energy into it. You just want to rely on the energy that's already innately there. That's kind of the whole point of crude oil, right? You want to save as much of that energy as possible. The liquid is going to be the heavier hydrocarbons and the vapor is going to be the natural gas and the light ends of the fluid, right? So this is an example where you're going to have a, a adiabatic flash where you have a liquid coming in, you'll drop the pressure which will also alter the temperature because some of the fluid will have to boil away. That's an endothermic process. The temperature will drop. You'll solve for the liquid and vapor compositions. But even for a crude oil mixture, right, which you think it's all hydrocarbons, it should be really straightforward. Routes law is not necessarily always going to be accurate. You're going to have to have some non-ideality correction. Now, a flash separation is really good when you have large differences in the vapor pressure between the vapor and the liquid components of the system. Now, in general, that's not going to be the case for a real chemical process. You're going to need something that's a little bit more controlled. And that's where we have distillation. So we are going to go over the basic premises of distillation today. Okay, who here has seen a description of a distillation process before? Who's a chemical engineer? Okay. So distillation in a rough sense can be sort of visualized as a series of flash separations. It's not really that, but kind of think of it a little bit as so. We feed a material in to a particular stage. The volatile components will travel up the column, right? They're vapors, they're lighter, they'll float up. The liquids, the heavy components, will fall down. Once the vapors get to the top of the column, they go through something called a condenser. This can be either a total condenser or a partial condenser. A total condenser will turn all of the vapor here into all liquid. Some of it will get sent back into the column. Some of it will go out as the distillate. That is your product usually. The liquid will fall down. The liquid will hit the bottom stage. It'll go out. Some of it will get collected as the bottom stream. This could be the product as well. 
some of it gets sent back into the column as a vapor. The reboiler will, will vaporize and boil that liquid again. So I don't remember the exact number, but distillation consumes approximately like 5% to 10% of all of the world's energy, which is an insane amount of information, right? Same number. The reason for that <clears throat> is it is the primary means of separation, not only for, for, for petroleum production and petrochemicals, but most chemical engineering processes rely on some form of distillation throughout the, throughout the system. Now the reason why it consumes such a very large fraction of energy is let's say, let's take a look at oil refining. The largest oil refineries in the world will, will distill over 500,000 barrels of oil per day. So imagine a barrel, right, would be about yay big. Now imagine 500,000 of those. Now imagine that happening every single day and there are probably you know, a few dozen refineries that are about that size or more. Now every single one of those barrels has to go through an atmospheric separator, which is a distillation column, where at the top you have a big refrigerator. And actually distillation is not quite, petroleum distillation is not quite the same as this, but as a general idea, you'll have a refrigerator and at the bottom you have a heater, right? So it's basically like opening your stove and opening your fridge side by side having them compete with one another. So it consumes a massive amount of energy. Why do we need to have a reboiler to send some of our material back and a condenser to send some of the material back? Why do we need that conceptually? Yes? Would it be because the separation is never perfect and you need more time to do it? Or the more time you reboil, the, um, the more pure your distillate becomes? So from a transient sense, kind of yes. There's a, more basic, there's a more basic reason for that, is that at every single stage, we need liquid and vapor. If we don't have liquid and vapor at every single stage, then effectively it's doing nothing. So what happens is if I feed my system and it's all liquid, and I don't boil any of it and send it back, the liquid goes to stage I, it falls down to stage I plus one, it falls down to stage I plus two, it falls down to stage I plus three, and then eventually just goes out the bottom and literally no separation has occurred. Likewise, if I send my feed in as a vapor, it'll just go right up, out, and pop out the distillate, and I get no separation. So it's basically just a big, empty drum that just slows the material down. So the only way that I can get a separation exploiting vapor-liquid equilibrium is if I take some of that liquid and I have to send it back into the column as a vapor to ensure that that vapor goes all the way up and I have to take some of the stuff that comes out of the top, turn it to a liquid to make sure it goes all the way back down to ensure that we have liquid at every single stage. So if we do not have liquid and vapor at every single stage, the distillation process breaks down. So a couple of things can happen. You can flood your distillation column, meaning if you feed too much liquid, you'll have an accumulation of liquid that will pile up. And as soon as that happens, your separation goes bad. Right? You can also have blowouts, more or less, where you have you know, a massive amount of vapor stream going up and, and, and it can actually knock all the stages off. And that's a very, very big problem as well. But you have to ensure a nice, delicate equilibrium where every single stage has just the right amount of liquid and vapor. It doesn't boil up too fast. It doesn't drift down too fast. Everything has to be in a nice equilibrium. And as it turns out, that's extremely hard to do. So back when I was a student here at the University of Utah, years ago, we had a distillation column that was donated by Chevron. And it was really cool. It was three stories tall, so you had to go in the basement, that's where the reboiler was and the pump was. You ran it more or less at infinite reflux, meaning that the bottoms you didn't collect and the distillate you didn't collect. You had a condenser at the top, which was a, a cooling water control valve. And you're on walkie-talkies, you know, talking to the person you have the reboiler and the condenser. They're like, oh, no, no, it's a little too hot in the column. Turn it down. Oh, it's a little too cold. Turn this up. It is virtually impossible by human precision and control alone to operate a distillation column effectively. You need to have some form of automated controls. Otherwise, the equilibrium and the balance is so tenuous that it's almost impossible to do so. So it was a fun exercise. Um, but that distillation column was extremely leaky, and so they got rid of it. <clears throat> How high was? 
Uh, it was not very big, maybe eight to 10 inches, about yay big. And then there was sampling ports. It was just isopropyl alcohol, water separation. And then you would take little samples at each different height. Uh, and then from there you would uh, do refractive index to figure out how close the, you were to real thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so a couple of other notes here. We're gonna call this V of the top stream, L of the top, L of the bottom, and V of the bottom. Q is gonna be called the reflux ratio. And it is defined as how much the ratio of how much liquid you're sending back into the column versus how much distillate you're pulling off the column. Now what we'll be talking about today is an assumption that sort of is a nice introduction to distillation. We're not gonna to spend too much time on it just today, but we're gonna be saying that we're gonna do something called an infinite reflux. We're not gonna take any distillate out. We're gonna send everything back into the column. So in order for us to have a separation, what that means is that I can't be feeding anything material here and I can't be pulling anything out. So in this case, the feed is equal to the bottom stream, equal to the distillate stream, which is equal to zero. So this is a, effectively a batch process. So it takes away a little bit of the complexity to understand how distillation occurs. Now a couple of the, the complexities of distillation is that you have to know what is the optimum position to feed the liquid at, right? Based on the ratio of volatile ends to heavy ends, you have to know uh, how many stages to have, you have to know how close each stage gets to equilibrium, you have to know the ratio of how much you send back, you have to know the ratio of how much you reboil. So these are all design parameters for a real distillation process. And to cover it in any real sort of sense, you have to have a separations class. But for the thermodynamic purposes, uh, infinite reflux is a nice uh, convenient way to look at it. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing is relying on some of the handouts so that I don't have to draw everything um, again on the board in as much detail as you have access to. So all my drawings won't be as precise or uh, as what you have um, as a handout. So the basic idea of distillation is that we have individual stages. So this is going to be stage I. It's going to have a liquid composition. It is going to have a vapor composition. It is going to have a total amount of liquid, a total amount of vapor. Now what's going to happen is that going up from this stage, it is going to be sending its vapor sort of information. What is the composition of the vapor phase and what's the quantity of vapor that it's sending out? Going down, it is going to be sending its liquid information. And then this process repeats an arbitrary number of times. But instead, this is going to be stage I minus one, that's just the nomenclature, X of I minus one, Y of I minus one, L of I minus one, V of I minus one, it's gonna be sending down X of I minus one, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Coming up from over here, you're gonna have Y of I plus one, V of I minus one. And this keeps on going up and down for as many number of columns as stages as you like to have. So, just a couple of quick conceptual questions. What is the pressure throughout the column? Constant. Why is the pressure constant? Well, 
Well, we could control the pressure at each stage differently, potentially. But think fluid mechanics. What happens when you have differences in pressure? Do you get flow? We do not want to have any bulk flow from here to there. We only want equilibrium fluid stages to exist. If I have bulk flow in the column, that defeats the whole purpose. It's basically like putting an impeller in there and mixing the whole process up. The objective is we don't want it to mix. So that's why we have the pressure is generally held constant. Now, strictly speaking, you probably are gonna have differences in pressure because you're gonna have pressure losses going through each of the constrictions at each stage, right? The most common form of stage that really isn't used anymore, but it's the classic example, is a bubble cap. So what happens here is that you have liquid uh, filling in a little reservoir, a little tray. The vapor bubbles up, down, around, and through. Now that encourages contact between the vapor and liquid, so you can have that mass transfer exchange so you can get the stages to come to equilibrium. Right? You need to have the opportunity for the volatile material to leave the liquid and go into the vapor stream. And you have to have the opportunity for the non-volatile material in the vapor to condense back into the liquid. So the only way that can happen is if they're in contact with one another. Okay, now temperature. Where is it hottest and where is it coldest? The bottom. The bottom. bottom. Okay, now why is it hottest at the bottom? Because it's hotter at the highest point. So what can someone say at the other end? Mm, that's where you're the component with the higher boiling point is so to get exactly. it back up. Right, so at the bottom, this is our heavy ends, our non-volatile components. So we get them to boil, you have to heat them up to a higher temperature, the condenser, you have to try really hard to cool down some fluid. So if you're ever doing cryogenic distillation, in that case you would never have a total condenser, you'd only have a partial condenser, otherwise it'd be extremely hard to, you know, cool down liquid oxygen or something like that. Okay, <clears throat> so going back to our drawing here, eventually we're going to reach the very, very top. We'll start from the top and go down. At the condenser, we have a vapor coming out. It condenses it. Some of it will go as a liquid back into the column, and some of it will go out as a distillate. In this case here, however, as D goes to zero, you're not pulling any product away. You're just sending everything back. That means that Everything that we're sending up to the top here, and I can add this in right here, so this we'll call this V, top, and L, top. We're going to send everything back into the column. Now what that also means is that the composition of the vapor coming off of stage one, which is going to be here, we'll call this stage one, In which case, this is effectively stage zero, the condenser. That means the vapor coming out of stage one is going to be fully condensed and return as the liquid from the condenser itself, which means that this is going to be equal to the composition of the fluid coming back from the condenser. Any questions? So the hardest part about distillation is just the nomenclature which is why I like to have handouts. Now, let's repeat this process, but again, now let's do our mass balance instead of on the condenser. Let's do the mass balance on stage one itself. So from here, we know that the liquid coming from the condenser, stage zero, is equal to the vapor coming from stage one. If we were to do a total mass balance on stage one, everything coming into the system, we have liquid zero plus vapor two, right? So stage two sends its vapor up equals everything that's leaving the stage, which is going to be vapor one and liquid one. one. 
So since the liquid coming from the condenser is the same as the vapor coming from this stage, we can conclude that everything being sent up here is also being sent down there. Right? So this out is the same as this in, which means this in is the same as this out. Okay, so I'm calling it a K balance. This is a species balance. The reason why I'm calling it K is because I've already chewed up I as a subscript. So this is any species in the system. It could be the more volatile components, it could be the least volatile components. So if you write out our general species balance, uh, in equals out for species K. So everything entering stage one Right, we have material coming up. Let's see, how do I oh, we'll follow my notes here? Okay. So we have material coming up from stage two. Mole fraction from of K from stage two multiplied by the total amount of material coming up from stage two as a vapor. Also entering the system is coming from the top. The mole fraction, the liquid of species K from stage zero, multiplied by the total amount of material coming from stage zero, which is the condenser, is equal to mole fraction of K in stage one, leaving as a vapor from stage one, plus the mole fraction of K in the liquid of stage one, multiplied by the liquid in stage one. Now, if we look at a species balance going to and from the condenser, that means that everything leaving the system, Y, K, 1, V, 1, so this is vapor component K, stage 1, leaving as a vapor, is equal to liquid K from the condenser. A lot of nomenclature, but the concept is relatively straightforward. This means that the mole fraction the mole fraction of all the material leaving is the same as the mole fraction as all the material coming back in. Same thing applies for the material being exchanged between stage one and stage two, right? So we can repeat the same analysis and come up with the same conclusion. Right, so if the same composition leaves and enters here, the same composition has to leave and enter here, right? It's the same exact concept of doing the mass balance total mass balance as you get the same conclusion for doing a species K balance. So this comes to our main conclusion for a distillation column at infinite reflux. We'll write this more generally. The mole fraction of species K at stage I is equal to the liquid at I minus 1, or we can write this at I plus 1 is equal to K of I. Have a 
there's a reason why we do this. I will mix with what Joe wants me to mix. Uh, I'm going to raise the drum here. Okay, so. In distillation, if my pressure is constant, what other type of phase diagram can I look at to understand the vapor liquid equilibrium? TXY. TXY. So what we do. Now, again, we're going to reconstruct the TXY diagram here. I'm going to put Z as the total composition. A lot of times charts will just say X. I like, I like to use the general nomenclature of Z. This is the more volatile component. Does the more volatile component boil at a low temperature or at a high temperature? <clears throat> the more volatile component will boil at the it's a lower temperature. Yeah, low temperature, yes, yes, yes. I always turn that off. So that's why we draw generally a TXY diagram like this. Right. <coughs> Which line is this one here? Do. <coughs> do. How do we know it's the do line? Temperature. So at high temperature, it's vapor. When I cool the vapor down, I condense it. That's the dew point. At low temperature, it's liquid. When I heat it up, it boils. This is the bubble point. So what I do is that in every single one of these stages, they are going to be at a particular pressure and temperature, in this case, of I minus 1, temperature of I, temperature of I plus 1. So I want to know, based on the liquid mole fraction, the vapor mole fraction, and the temperature, what is going on with the phase equilibrium here? How do I accomplish understanding each stage on this TXY diagram? Constant pressure through the whole column, and every single stage has a composition and a temperature. How do I lock that in on this TXY diagram? Can I multiply the length for the constant temperature? Perfect. So let's say that this is the temperature of stage I. I have now access to the oops, liquid mole fraction and the vapor mole fraction. I can repeat this again. In this case here, I'm at a higher temperature. This must be temperature I minus 1. X of I minus 1, Y of I minus 1. I could be down here, temperature of I plus 1. Hey, is that right? Uh, no, I should be down here. So I missed it. So I plus 1. Right. Yeah, yeah. Higher temperature. Now this assumes that we know what the temperature and composition of each of the stages are. So instead what we do for every temperature we grab the vapor mole fraction and the liquid mole fraction and we plot those against each other. And we create the XY diagram. So 
So that means, for example, this point right here would correspond to some y and some x that might be this one and that one. Is everyone clear on how we create the xy diagram? So we do that from the correlation. <laughs> We do that from the solution of our phase diagram. So this is the TXY diagram. And for a given temperature, right, so this one, let's say here, is temperature of I. It's going to have a corresponding mole fraction in the vapor and a corresponding mole fraction in the liquid. This point over here will have a different temperature. This point over here will have a different temperature. But the pressures will all be constant. So it's just a translation of this diagram to another curve. Yes. So all we're doing is instead we're cross plotting the dew curve against the bubble curve. And there's a reason why we do this. And it comes back to this concept here. It allows us to solve a distillation problem using a nice, fun little graphical methodology. And this is all that we'll talk about with distillation. So let's say, hypothetically, we want, in this case here, a distillate composition here, or in this case, L0, uh, sorry, L2. We want x of 0 to be equal to y of 1 of some purity of our component. That's our objective. Now the higher purity we want this, we'll see that it takes more and more steps to get there. So what we will do, and this is why we have uh, your, your XY diagram here. Well, I've already drawn the solution, right? So we have an XY diagram here. So according to, there's no way I'm gonna be able to draw this correctly here. So I'll just do it without numbers. So if this is the desired composition purity of our product, Maybe we're selling it to someone or it goes into another process. Our starting point is that we know that the top product, and of course I've raised my distillation column here, this is the total condenser. So the vapor coming out of stage one is going to be totally condensed and be sent back in from the condenser. That corresponds to a point on my y equals x line. x of zero is equal to y of one. Now, what I do is I draw a horizontal line to where my y equals x, sorry, where my xy curve intersects it. This is going to be my equilibrium for stage one. Right? Routes law says, or the fugacity is being equal then, that this is going to dictate my composition of the liquid for stage one and the composition of my vapor for stage one. That's why here, this is my vapor composition of stage one. That's why I draw a horizontal line for my vapor of stage one. Does anyone have any questions so far? Many of you probably remember the stepping procedure, but I wanted to go over why that's the case. Now, this is our material balance that tells us that the vapor of the next stage is equal to the liquid of the current stage. Now we want to get to stage two, so that means that the liquid of my first stage is going to be equal to my vapor of the next. So I draw a line here where x of stage one is equal to y of stage two which means that I then draw a horizontal line to here, which is my equilibrium for stage two, where I've determined my liquid composition and my vapor composition. I repeat the process again. The liquid of my current stage is equal to the vapor of the next stage. I draw a dashed line here. Liquid of two is equal to vapor of stage three, I go on over here, 
This is my equilibrium for stage three. This is stage four. And let's say this is stage five. So if this is the case over here, that would be the composition of my bottom string. So let's take a quick moment to think about this. This is my more volatile component, meaning that my volatile component has a very low mole fraction in the bottom of the column, which is the objective. It has a very high composition in the top of the column, which is the objective. Right, our plan here is to separate the volatile from the non-volatile. So this is a two-component system. That would mean that you know, your heavy component would be really enriched in the bottom stream, and your heavy component would be really depleted in your top stream. Now this only works for infinite reflux, but this only relies on a material balance. It doesn't know anything about the vapor-liquid equilibrium process. So regardless of how complicated the vapor-liquid equilibrium is, if you have access to a phase diagram, you can create the XY, and you can use that information to determine how to separate the two materials by distillation. Now, if you recall back to your separations and design course as an undergraduate, you'll recall that you have like tie lines and you don't necessarily get equilibrium at every stage. This can be a lot more complicated. But in an ideal best case scenario, the infinite reflux scenario gives us the minimum number of equilibrium stages to accomplish the separation. But recall that in order to reach equilibrium, that means that the fluid has to spend an infinite amount of time at each stage which is not a particularly practical way to separate a real product. Right? So you're going to have to suffer some consequences where every single stage is not going to be at 100% equilibrium. But all of these complications are things that we're going to gloss over uh, because it, it takes a lot more technical sort of tinkering around to get to that point of understanding. Okay, let's see. I think that's it, actually. That's all I wanted to cover today. Um, so we'll talk about non-ideal vapor-liquid vapor equilibrium on Wednesday. I'm going to get a homework posted, so vacation is over, unfortunately. Um, and as a reminder for the department fellows, send me your list of PhD research projects no later than tomorrow at the end of the day. And then we'll begin the process of assigning students to groups. Any questions? Have a good weekend. Welcome back.